first group of federal employees to rebel. They've made history, and good history, too. We have not yet seen the first group of State Department employees bolt discipline come to the public and say, our policy is anti-American and we'll have no more of it. We have not yet seen the first delegation of health, education, and welfare employees bolt discipline come to the public and say, these are wasteful. They are giveaways. It is a disgrace what's happening to that money, and we're going to disassociate ourselves with it. But this is the closest thing we've come. We've got immigration and naturalization workers saying we are compelled to do things not in the interest of the United States, and we are protesting. Oh, well, that's exactly what they're doing. Incidentally, they have tried to get some of the story out to their uh, spokesman, but they haven't released parts of it because they can't really uh, do it. But uh, let it be said that we have got a tremendous problem now. One, problem one, what do we do with the thousands of Cuban criminals, prostitutes, and other undesirables, including insane people, who we now have on our holding? There, there have been some, incidentally, of the criminals who were, who were criminals on a lesser scale. Uh, not the murderers and the worst of them, but some of the lesser criminals have already been released in somebody's custody, in effect. Uh, they, they found sponsors for them. But you have thousands of others that are now being held. They're being held, incidentally, on an executive order until January 15th, when their final status will be decided, which means, in effect, that uh, President Carter will be able to pass this along to uh, Ronald Reagan if Carter loses. Charlie, I wish we had more time. Thank you for filling this much of it with information. Uh, okay, okay. Take care, Tom. Charles Wiley, founder of the Committee for Responsible Patriotism, knifing into the story of the sick out, I call it a rebellion, of the Immigration and Naturalization Service after the frustration at trying to do the American law and order due process of law thing with the rebellious Iranian students arrested in the District of Columbia. A madhouse, according to Benny. That's his name, Benny. Call me again. I really wouldn't. Hey, am I trying to overthrow the government? I would love to see more federal workers, state workers, and city workers embarrass their departments by coming to us and saying, hey, folks, the criticisms uh, are not only valid, but like Jolson said, you ain't heard nothing yet. Listen to the way it really was and the way it really is. That could save America. Mm -hmm. This is a and I, I think I hit it right on the head. The Carter is afraid, if you remember, the Ayatollah started to say they were talking about putting our houses on trial because of the atrocities committed against our students here. Carter is in deadly fear of those Iranian students because if anything happens to a hostage, he's through politically. It's a it's so simple. The Carter just back Carter, I'm, I'm quite sure maybe the immigration department back off on those Iranian students. I mean it it, it, it has to be. I mean, right. <laughs> where did come from? May I ask what part of academia you were attached to? Sure, okay. I was at Rutgers University. Uh -huh. And what was what was what was your field? I was a historian, librarian. Uh -huh. I yeah, well, you know, you are in such great position. Your voice is young and energetic. How old do you think I am? Uh, from your voice, I wouldn't guess a day over 55. I'm, I'm 66. I majored in speech at one time. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, as a matter of fact, one, uh, one, one day, uh, Ruth Carter Stapleton was down at Rutgers University. And uh, it was a hot night. I went down because I could test her. You know, she, she was caught trying to convert Jews to Christianity. This is just this, this evangelism. Mm -hmm. With her born-again ranch at 90 hours ahead for the weekend. Mm -hmm. And a professor passed out in the heat. And she got down on the stage and prayed and prayed for deliverance of his soul. And he came too. And she took credit for it. Mm -hmm. I, I asked her a question. Uh, why she didn't, uh, why did she didn't leave uh, people to see their own religion without her evangelism? Uh, you know, and right now you could ask her question. Why is she so concerned with saving Jewish souls when she should worry more about her son mm -hmm. driving around in a drunken condition with marijuana? Uh, no, uh, I do not like to hear religious japes by atheists. I am a God-fearing man. Oh, so so my, I'm, I'm a very devout... No, 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 you weren't japing. I'm about to jape. Uh, uh, it, what you just told me reminds me of a story that uh, 
Bill Rusher of National Review told me, and I haven't been able to union leaders. Of course, they want freedom, sir. They want, and then they're not going to stop with electing their own leaders. They know that the de our only ace in the hole, may I repeat, as long as I have one little vocal cord to play off of, our only ace left, we have destroyed every one of our aces. We have plowed them under. The only ace we have left on the planet Earth, not the Army, Navy, Marines, Coast Guard, or the Rockettes. The only ace we have left is that everybody on our side prefers our side, and everybody on their side prefers our side, too. Go ahead. Uh, the second thing happened to do with a uh, car commercial by one of our big three automotive companies. And the enemy is... Gary? Yes, sir. Uh, I know you like to reminisce. Yeah. Uh, you like some nostalgia. Right. Well, uh, I was watching both conventions this year, and uh, the first nationally televised convention was in 1948. I saw them. Uh, now, uh, when they had this tribute to uh, Walter Cronkite, they started with 1952, because that was the first one he was in. Uh-huh. But I saw people like H.V. Calvin-Born, uh, Edward R. Murrow, uh, uh, Elmer Davis and people like that. And they did the same things that these new fellas or relatively new fellas are doing now, the Rathers and the, mm -hmm. and the, the Cronkites and so forth. But people see, uh, in those days, Barry, I, I uh, might have been shocked at what happened. But you see, when I watch these now, it doesn't really surprise me because in our political system, and the way we do things, this is what you have to do if you want to be president. I heard someone on your show earlier criticizing uh, uh, Mondale last night for the type of speech that he made and the references he was making, and I agree with him. But I don't think it's any worse, for example, than uh, in, the, in the 1948 convention, uh, in the Republican National Convention, there was a deadlock between Mr. Dewey and Mr. Taft of Ohio. Right. And uh, to use your phrase, I'm pretty sure Barry Gray and Bert Knapp will... Uh, 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 give witness to this, uh, if I'm sure they remember. Now, uh, after the sixth ballot, and uh, not having been able to reach a conclusion, they recessed at 12 noon. At 6 p.m. that evening, they reconvened, and Mr. Dewey was unanimously nominated. Hmm. Now, you don't have to be Sherlock Holmes to figure out that they sat down and said, well, look, the best fellow that has a chance to win this <laughs> is Mr. Dewey. Right. And we'll do this for you, and you do that. This is part of our system. But what got me was, when Mr. Dewey got up to make his acceptance speech, and I'm not sure I'm quoting him verbatim, but in effect, his words were, Ladies and gentlemen, I come to you unfettered and without having made a promise, and I fell off the chair. Yeah, you're great. Even though I was in my 20s. But you see, so these things really don't shock me anymore. Uh, and I, you just have to take it with a little grain of salt. Sir, thank you very much. I take you with a grain of oregano. You're delicious. <laughs> take care. Okay, Barry. WMCA, Barry Farber. Yes, Barry. Yes, sir. Yes, of course, I like that uh, remark that uh, Barry Goldwater disclosed that... Uh, uh, Jimmy Carter promised the sailors on board an aircraft carrier that he would work uh, very hard to see that they got a raise in salary and et cetera in better conditions and what have you. And then that very night, uh, President Carter vetoed a bill which would have given the sailors a, a wage increase. And of course, the uh, well, the Democrats are good campaigners. They eh? actually they're not reluctant to say anything, to promise anything. And of course, the uh, uh, well, Governor Reagan. Uh, Maybe he's too much of a gentleman. He'll have to uh, uh, come down, uh, come down to earth, and uh, and slug it out a bit. Because he, uh, even though President Carter is a is a, is a terrible president, I think he's an excellent campaigner, and, he, and uh, he's pretty good at campaigning. He is, sir. And thank you very much. I've got to go. Uh, something you said reminded me of the. The, uh, the last laugh, the last laugh on that Goldwater little girl picking the daisy atomic bomb commercial came too late to help Goldwater. It came after the election. Do you remember? Does anybody remember the last laugh of the Goldwater-Johnson campaign? It came many years after the 1964 election. Those who voted for Goldwater said, They told me if I voted for Goldwater, the war in Vietnam would escalate. And I did, and it did. WMCA, Barry Farber. Uh, Barry. Yes. Uh, at the Democratic Convention, both Ted Kennedy and uh, Mondale supposedly quoted uh, Reagan as saying that fascism was the basis of the New Deal. 